welcome you this, this morning to uh, our, our conference, uh, our conversation, if you will, really, about tapping the silver economy. And I want to welcome you to Providence, a place that together we hope to make the best city in America for older adults to work, live, play, learn. And it's a place where the best and brightest can come, and come, can come here to test and scale with others the innovative ideas, products, and services that we'll capitalize on and unleash the silver economy here in Providence. A couple of administrative notes. If you have your cell phones on, please uh, program them to stun or silent. Uh, exits are in the back, as are the restrooms uh, in the event that you need to get up uh, and leave for whatever reason. Um, but again, I want to thank you all for being here. Uh, I want to thank the committee. This, this does not happen overnight. Uh, a group of folks have been working for a better part of a year to try to put this conversation together for all of us today. I want to thank Allison Beebe and Tina Chow from, from Giant Shoulders, Betty, uh, Betsy Santralaski from the Partnership for Greater Providence, Mark Wong, uh, Providence uh, City Hall and uh, Economic Development, Peter Asin, the City of Providence, uh, the time was the Office of Healthy Communities is now with strategic partnerships. Uh, Ken Kaplan and Anna Quadras from Sloan, uh, from MIT, I should say. Catherine Taylor from URI. Uh, Diane Lynch from SCG, Social Enterprise Greenhouse. So thank you all for being here, and please give our uh, all of our volunteers who put this together. Our, our speakers and, and moderators today, uh, all their information and bios are online and the materials that you received electronically, so uh, I will not uh, give too many introductions or too long an introduction to all those folks, but uh, if you want to learn more about any of the folks you're hearing from today, that information is in the online uh, materials that you see when you register. I also need to thank the sponsors. Uh, this does not come together without uh, generous support from the community. Uh, first, our host, the City of Providence, Social Enterprise Greenhouse, and the Partnership for Greater Providence. Uh, our lead sponsor, uh, Lifespan, our gold sponsor, Hasbro, silver sponsor, CGI, AAA, Tufts Health Plan Foundation, URI, and Verizon, and our bronze sponsors, Optimity Advisors, RISD, Brown, Zymedica, and Rhode Island College. So with that administrative information out of the way, I, I want to sort of just try to frame the conversation that we hope to have today. And first, maybe by trying to answer the question, what do we mean by the silver economy? And what we mean by that is thinking differently about the older population, older adult population here in Providence and around the state. And how do we tap it from a couple of different dimensions? The human capital perspective. How do we draw from the talents, insight, expertise, and experience of our older adults? From a market perspective, how do we design specialized products and services from which older adults can be a target market as consumers? And from a service perspective, how do, how do you know, the public sector in this state and across the country and the city spends quite a bit of money on serving older adults in the areas of health, housing, et cetera. And so how can we harness the power of the private sector and the creativity of the entrepreneurial community to develop innovative solutions to better serve and support the older adult population so that we can maximize their human capital and the market opportunities that are before us? So we're asking you to think differently, to ask questions differently, to engage differently, and to use this opportunity to interact with folks that you might not have the ordinarily the opportunity to encounter. And so a lot of conversations and my hope is that there are people in this room that you have not met. Too many of our conversations are ourselves speaking with ourselves, uh, having the same conversation, maybe in a different place, but with the same outcome, with the same results. So we hope that with a different mix of folks, with a different kind of conversation, we might land in a different place. And not just today, but going forward. So to, again, today is, is, is really about thinking about the issue of, of older adults, the opportunity of the silver economy, uh, from a perspective that can range from the deeply personal, as I was going to reach for my glasses before this light worked, as I think about my advancing age and my parents, uh, all the way to the realm of policy and everything in between. And so we hope that you bring all of those perspectives to this conversation that we're going to be having together. So what I want to do, uh, we're going to, we'll introduce the mayor when he arrives in a little bit. So I'm going to jump the agenda a little bit. Um, and introduce our first speaker. So the, the two speakers we have as keynoters, uh, Dr. Marianne Rondo and um, Martin Keane, are going to help us set the tone for the rest of the morning. Uh, we've asked them to provide a framework, a common understanding of the state of the state, state of the city, I guess, when it comes to older adults in Providence and across Rhode Island, as well as a framework to help us engage in this conversation from a design thinking perspective. Their bios are, uh, again, online, so I'll let their accomplishments speak for themselves, but what I want to do first is welcome Dr. Marianne Romando to help us understand the magnitude and the nature of this opportunity that we are presented with when it comes to the local silver economy. So Dr. Romando.
Jen. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Well, I'm delighted to be here this morning, uh, and I want to begin by commending you and the City of Providence for reframing and rethinking aging. I just, I'm excited to be part of this. Um, so I think we've all heard the statistics, and there's no question that our population, not only in Providence, not only in Rhode Island, not only in the United States, but globally, we are aging. In 1900, the life expectancy was 48. Now, it's nearly 80. I wonder why divorce is on the rise. <laughs> in Rhode Island, nearly 20% of our population is over 65. And very soon, projections are that one in four Rhode Islanders will be age 65 and over. And we have the honor of being number one in the country in the proportion of our population that is 85 and older. So clearly we're doing something right if all of our older adults are staying here to their older years. And so Jim said this is conversation. And so I think about this conversation, this dialogue, and how we talk about this. And often I hear this word, oh, tsunami of older adults. And I really dislike that term. To me, tsunami is this fearful, frightening, dreadful image. And we then talk about, oh, how we are going to react and respond and adapt to this. But really, I think the dialogue, the conversation should be about not how we respond or react or adapt, but how we create, how we shape, how we design, and how we build. And I think that's what today is all about. I think the city of Providence gets that we have an opportunity to embrace older adults and to engage, involve them, and provide them the services and the supports that they need as they age. So I teach a class at the college sometimes um, called Human Development Across the Lifespan. And in this class, we study all the stages of life from infancy until death. And when we get to the later years of life, older adulthood, um, I begin by asking my lovely millennial students, um, some of whom are here today, graduates, so I'm thrilled to see, um, what comes to mind when I say the term older adult? And here's how they typically answer me. Gray hair, wrinkled skin, deaf, slow, forgetful, sick, lonely, sad. Now, having hit one of those milestone birthdays myself this summer, I immediately fail them all at this point. Because <laughs> they're wrong. As George Byrne said, growing old doesn't mean you have to get old. And the later years of life don't necessarily have to mean decline, disability, disease, and death. They can be years of well-being and fulfillment for older adults. So I think about the 68-year-old woman that I met a week ago, who was the Director of Residential Services at an assisted living community not far from here. I was visiting the assisted living community, and the Executive Director told me how this particular manager thinks nothing of working double shifts back to back. And she runs circles around her 20-year-old something employees. Certainly, a lot of stamina. I think about the 94-year-old man that I met at the South Kingstown Senior Center who delivers courses in history to other members of the Senior Center. No problem with his memory. I think about my own 86-year-old mom, who at 86 still balances her checkbook to the penny, reads the Providence Journal cover to cover, and is incredibly ingenious and resourceful. Just this past weekend, I was helping her clean up her house after the holidays, and I was about to throw out all her dead poinsettia plants. And she yelled at me, stop, don't throw those out. I'm like, mom, they're dead. 
But that soil is rich and good soil. Put them outside. I'll use it for planting in the spring. Now, I was a bit annoyed at, the min at that moment, but I stopped and thought how much money I spent on potting soil come April and May. And then as I was about to throw out her Christmas card, she again yelled at me. And she reminded me that she cuts them up and she makes gift tags for presents for next year. Now she'll probably kill me for telling you all this, so don't let me know my <laughs> And look at Tony Bennett, still singing beautifully at 90, and our own newly elected President Trump, age 70, technically a senior citizen, but obviously full of him and vigor. <laughs> so now let me ask you all a question. You are here to talk about building the Providence economy and improving the quality of life for your residents. So if I gave you the option of bringing in 1,000 new residents to the city of Providence, would you decide to bring in 1,040 year olds or 1,060 year olds? Any takers? Yeah. Well, a survey was actually conducted by grant makers in aging of mayors across the country. I don't know if Mayor Alozzi was part of that. But these mayors were asked this very question. And overwhelmingly, over 90% of the mayors responded, 40 year olds. Wrong answer. Why? Because as you have recognized by this forum this morning, there is opportunity to tap into the stamina, strength, resourcefulness, and smarts of our older adults and build our economy. So what do we know? Well, first, older adults are consumers. And they tend to have more disposable income than younger adults. Their kids are grown. Their houses are paid for their mortgages are paid for, their college tuition is paid for, and they spend. And when they spend, they create jobs for our economy. Older adults don't necessarily retire at age 65. Increasingly, people are postponing retirement. Many people working into well into their 70s. I think of my own dad, who was 60, when the company with which he was an executive with left the state of Rhode Island. And he was a chemist, a metallurgist, a scientist who became, went into management. And at age 60, he went into sales. And for the next 10 years, he was on the road selling. And when he retired, finally, he volunteered at the San Miguel School, running a science club after school for kids. And I remember him in his you know, mid-70s, sitting at our kitchen table, scouring through his old chemistry books, trying to think of creative ways to make rockets for the boys so they'd be excited about science. Many older adults are pursuing bridge careers, second careers. They'll leave a job and then go into consulting. Many start their own business, they're entrepreneurs. Actually, a survey by Gallup shows that older adults are twice as likely as younger adults to start a new business. And what about older adults in the workforce, like my 60-year-old friend that I met last week? Well, some feel that older adults are slower, not as productive. <clears throat> not true again. Actually, they bring a wealth of knowledge and skill and competency and become wonderful trainers and mentors to newer employees. I'm doing a lot of work in workforce development in healthcare, and I'm saddened when I visit employers and they tell me about our recent college grads. They don't like it when I hear about the work ethic that I'm hearing. They're late for work. They think nothing of calling out. They don't dress professionally. Older adults would never let these things happen. Older adults serve their community. Baby boomers are wealthier, healthier, and they're more apt to become civically engaged and involved in <coughs> volunteer work. So they can make a tremendous contribution to our communities. Not too long ago, I had to take my son to South County Hospital. 
and we had to arrive very early. It was like 5.30 in the morning. And we were greeted at the hospital by a gentleman in his mid-70s who escorted us to the registration desk. And then when we finished registration, another woman came to take us to the pre-op area, and I chatted with her, and she told me she was 94 years old. Up at 5.30, 6 in the morning, volunteering. Older adults make more philanthropic investments than younger adults, more charitable contributions. And older adults pay taxes, but they don't use services like younger adults would, for example, public schools. <clears throat> and then let's think about the support they provide in terms of caregiving. <clears throat> Many older adults are helping grandchildren with college tuition. They're helping their children with babysitting. And so many older adults are caring for their even older parents in their home. And millions, I think it's $2 billion in Rhode Island, um, is actually consumed by these older adults who are providing this unpaid care to loved ones. So in the state of Rhode Island, older adults generate over $281 million in federal and state taxes. 18% of those over 65 in Rhode Island are still working. And as I just said, older adults are caregivers. It's estimated that nearly $2 billion in unpaid services are being provided about older adults. So clearly today, you have asked the right question. How do we tap into this population? Well, one idea that's been proposed by the World Health Organization is this concept of age-friendly communities. And this idea has now been embraced by AARP. And momentum is gain, gaining not only in the United States, but globally to implement concepts of age-friendliness. So what is an age-friendly community? Basically, an age-friendly community is a community that's good to grow up in and a community to grow old in. Age-friendly communities provide affordable housing, access to transportation, open space for recreation and safe travel. Age-friendly communities provide coordinated health and social services. And age-friendly communities provide opportunities for engagement, social connectedness, and civic engagement. In the state of Rhode Island, we actually have begun this journey towards age-friendliness. Some of you may be familiar with this initiative, and I know some of you have been involved. Brief history, and I'll bring you up to date in terms of where we're at today. In 2014, the Lieutenant Governor's Long-Term Care Coordinating Council formed a committee called Aging in the Community. And this committee was charged with assessing the needs of older adults in Rhode Island and identifying gaps in services for older adults. As part of that committee, we collected a lot of data, we interviewed key informants, and we conducted focus groups with older adults all across Rhode Island. And part of this work, I need to give credit to the Tufts Health Plan Foundation, was uh, funded by a grant that enabled us to do this. Um, the report, we published a report, which is still posted on the Lieutenant Governor's website. We presented it at the State House in June. Um, which identified lots of problems in the state of Rhode Island and lots of opportunities for rethinking and reframing old adulthood. So let me just give you a snippet of some of the things that we found. And our findings we categorized in terms of the domains of age friendliness that the World Health Organization has put forth. So first we looked at communication and information for older adults. And we found that in the state of Rhode Island, we do not have a no wrong door, one stop approach for older adults to go to and find valuable information they need about 
available services. And we heard from older adults that they want this information. Yes, some <coughs> use a computer and will go to a website. Other older adults told us, I read the newspaper, I listen to the radio, find ways to give me this information. Clearly, an opportunity for you all. Housing. Over and over and over, we heard concerns about housing among our older adults. Those who are renting are worried about rising rent. I actually conducted these focus groups, and so many of our older adults said to me, I love where I'm at, but I'm worried I won't be able to stay there. And then what about homeowners? Homeowners are worried about increasing property taxes, and their biggest concern is keeping up with their home, maintaining it. Things break. Things need to be fixed. They're not able to do this. They don't know where to go to get help to do this. Yards need to be kept up. Or perhaps they can't afford these services. And one very well-intentioned policy, legislation that was created a while back to commingle older adults with younger disabled in subsidized housing has not really panned out for our older adults. We heard story after story after story in our housing complexes of how older adults are afraid because many of these younger adults um, struggle with substance use issues or mental health issues and older adults don't feel safe in, these, um, in their housing communities. We heard about a lot of problems with transportation, transportation inadequate in the state of Rhode Island. We heard about bus routes that really don't meet the needs of our older adults. We heard about the location of bus stops that older adults can't get to. We heard about older adults who really have difficulty riding a bus or can't afford the bus. And then we heard a lot of opportunities to improve the logistic care system, which RIPTA has subcontracted to. Lots of problems with delays and pickup people being stranded at physician's offices not being picked up, opportunities for improvement. We did look at open space and recreational areas, and we heard again from older adults that there were problems with traffic and intersections, traffic lights not being in the right place, and older adults are afraid to get out and walk. In terms of health care, while older adults are on Medicare, they still have co-pays, which they may not be able to afford. The co-pay program in the state of Rhode Island, not going far enough to help lower income folks who need support at home. Behavioral health, we heard about older adults struggling with behavioral health issues, not knowing where to go, where to get services, and again, high co-pays which prevent them from obtaining this care. Shortage of geriatricians in the state. And while most older adults told us I have a primary care doc, when they needed to see a specialist, there were problems with lack of these specialists or not being able to get in on time, or again, I couldn't get there, transportation issues. In terms of social engagement, what we heard from our older adults is, we're running on empty, more opportunities. The good thing we heard was, and none of us expected to hear this, was that our older adults love going to senior centers in Providence and across the state. I heard, visited some of the senior centers in Providence and heard wonderful stories about, this is my home, this is my community. I come in the morning for my morning coffee. I stay for lunch. I go on the trips. I participate in the activities. This is my support system. And yet we've cut our senior centers. Support clearly that our older adults value. Supports to remain at home, we don't have the capacity in the state of Rhode Island to enable people to age well in their home. Again, cuts to the elder respite program, which gives relief to caregivers, is problematic. Our home care system is in a state of crisis. Home care agencies tell us that they're not able, due to reimbursement constraints, to offer adequate wages to their CNAs and nurses, and they have high turnover. We're not able to adequately train these folks in complex comorbid conditions or behavioral health needs of our older adults. And so we heard from case managers throughout the state of Rhode Island that they're making these referrals for health services for older adults, but these referrals aren't being met. 
So yesterday, we convened as a coalition to begin this process of implementing an age-friendly Rhode Island. Uh, almost 100 people gathered at the Radisson and Warwick to begin to put some meat on the bones of a strategic plan that we've developed to begin to implement some ideas of age-friendliness in Rhode Island. So let me just share with you before I close some of the ideas from other age-friendly communities throughout the country and just some of the ideas that came up yesterday which I think provide an opportunity for the city of Providence as you move forward to tap the silver economy. Well, in the area of housing, opportunities to create new models of housing. So people talked about why not housing developments that build services in, housing where people can exercise, perhaps where people can shop, perhaps where people can eat, or perhaps where there's a wellness center or behavioral health services right in housing. There are lots of intergenerational models out there where younger adults are living with older adults. And interestingly, when I did the focus groups, lots of older adults said to me, hey, remember that show, The Golden Girls? Yeah, I remember the Golden Girls. Well, why not that kind of model of living? We would go for that, where small groups of older adults could come together and live together. Opportunities for home maintenance services. It seems like we need this. You know, opportunity to grow businesses where people can go out and help older adults fix up, maintain their home or their yards. Transportation. Uber for older adults. Co-ops, where people share rides. Yesterday at our meeting, people talked about why not shuttles from Stop and Shop or Walmart, which go out into our communities, pick up older adults to go for shopping. And then they said, why don't retailers offer a cafe in a Stop and Shop, where older adults can come, have a cup of coffee, and sit and chat and socialize. We hear a lot about the opportunities for telehealth. Uh, to support older adults who are alone in their home. I heard a lot in my focus groups from older adults who said, you know what, I'm diabetic, I have high blood pressure, but I don't feel like walking. I don't stay on my diet because I'm all alone and I don't have anybody to motivate or encourage me. Telehealth could play a role here. Wrapping up, okay. So mobile food trucks, mobile health vans, Somebody said to us yesterday, and there's lots in the literature about this, what about marketing and advertising to totally change the stigma of how we look at <coughs> aging? My millennials are wrong. Aging isn't about gray hair and wrinkled skin. How do we change that? Innovative senior centers, there's models all over the country of senior centers who are offering entrepreneurial job development or wellness programs, discounts for fitness centers, discounts for theaters, plays, cultural events opportunities to grow this economy. So in closing, I want to leave you with two spots that you can go to for more information. The first is a website that went live yesterday. Um, it's agefriendlyri.org, where you can find all the reports, um, what we've done so far um, to help towards your work. And we will be beginning, we will be continuing as cities and towns throughout the state of Rhode Island pursue age friendliness, we will be posting their stories so you can share and learn from each other. And finally, um, some of you may have heard that the Tufts Health Plan Foundation also has funded a tremendous uh, report of uh, community profiles and aging in Rhode Island. Really some interesting statistics about the city of Providence, some good, some not so good. And you can find that report at healthyagingdatareports.org um, and look at the community profile for the city of Providence. So, I wish you well. This is very exciting. Have a wonderful rest of the day. Great to be here. Thank you, Dr. Armando. And as the mayor comes up, I just want to thank him for his leadership. Um, when the mayor talks about one Providence, he talks about thinking about the assets of our community, not just the needs, but the assets. And he, and he inspires us to think cross sector. He, th he inspires us to think outside of our silos to have different kinds of conversations, bringing together different groups of folks.
work on common concerns and ultimately reach common solutions. So with that, Mayor Larson. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Thank you, Jim. And thank you to uh, everyone for being here today. It is really great to see such a great, such a, such a cross-sector of different industries, environments, and, and groups here in the room today. And that's exactly what we hope to achieve. As Jim just mentioned, Providence is so rich with so many diverse resources. And, uh, you know, in, in today's economy, it's not linear in terms of how do we build up. It's how do we build across these silos to make sure that the connective tissue between great institutions, organizations, and ideas is as strong uh, and rich as possible. So I want to thank all of the folks who made this day possible, beginning with Mark Wong, my Director of Economic Development, Betsy Centralasi from the Partnership for Greater Providence, Diane Lynch, also from the Partnership, Catherine Taylor from URI, Ken Kaplan from MIT, Allison Beebe from Giant Shoulders, and all of our, spark, and all of our sponsors and co-hosts. The Social Enterprise Greenhouse is one of the co-hosts for today's event, along with the Partnership um, and the City of Providence, and uh, in particular, our gold sponsor for today, who believes in this approach to innovation and economic development, is Hasbro as our lead sponsor. But we have a number of folks who have also joined on, uh, including Verizon, the University of Rhode Island, CGI, uh, uh, AAA, Tufts Health Plan Foundation, RISD, Brown, Cymedica, Optimity, and Rhode Island College. Please a big round of applause for all of our sponsors today. So, in addition to all of our sponsors, I want to thank all of our community stakeholders, all the business leaders, the advocates, the event organizers, and everyone for taking time out of your valuable, hours out of your valuable time of the day to discuss the potential for our city and how we will work collaboratively around the silver economy. As many people in this room know, by the year 2050, the over 65 population in the United States will double to 83.7 million people. And almost 25% of these seniors will be over the age of 85. Over 25% doing some quick math. That's around 20 million people, over 20 million people, above the age of 85. In human history, I don't think that's ever been achieved. This will require some additional caregiving and support. And with this trend, the U.S. will undoubtedly face challenges to address the strain on families, on businesses, on health care providers, and entitlement programs that work to meet the needs of the aging. As mayor, I'm excited that Providence at the center of innovation and creativity can, ha can help to tackle this nationwide and increasingly so global problem. Our city has a diverse group of co diverse coalition of higher education, regional corporate, and community leaders who are committed to advancing a creative, connected, and collaborative PVD, or what we're calling a C3 strategy. Creative, connected, and collaborative. C3 is a comprehensive approach to bring stakeholders to the table to solve global issues with the resources already available here in our city. For this approach, first we have to nurture artists, chefs, creators, makers, kitchens, mills across the, Winsaka, the Winasquatucket River and in our innovation district and beyond different creative neighborhoods of the city. We have to develop a smart city we have to develop a smart city that has this deep and strong connective tissue that supports development while building a pipeline to jobs, investment, and long-term innovation. Third, we have to cultivate co collaborations. And this is perhaps the secret sauce to all of this. Collaborations between our crafters, our artists, hobbyists, and our creative entrepreneurs, along with the established business community, to solve these real-world problems. I'm thrilled that C3 brings together stakeholders in Greater Providence who may not normally sit at the table together so that here we can you know, have the opportunity to leverage each other's strengths and form a group that will be a catalyst for new innovation. By using a C3 approach for what is called the silver economy, 
We can explore how our local chefs, for example, can create food as medicine to help nourish seniors. With this approach, we can also connect de developers, colleges, and nursing homes to build affordable housing for seniors. This could be housing, for example, that students live in, uh, uh, perhaps at a reduced rent, in exchange for spending time with seniors and teaching them about social media, the internet, and other areas of interest. It's that social cohesion that matters most. With this approach, we really have the opportunity to bridge the gap between generations while reducing student loan costs and the strains that families and care caregivers face. Let's be creative and let's think beyond our normal bonds on how to find solutions to these lasting challenges. These are just a few examples, and I'm sure that through this discussion and that that will follow, we'll come up with better and bigger ones. But this C3, this C3 strategy can benefit not only seniors in the aging economy, but our entire city as well. I am happy that with the help of the Partnership for Future Greater Providence and our event host, Social Enterprise Greenhouse, today you, you will be able to take part in four exciting workshops. First, a mobility workshop. This workshop will explore how partnerships between for-profit transportation providers can meet the transportation needs of seniors in a financially sustainable way. Now, as mayor, I go out to senior centers uh, on a weekly basis, and I can tell you from experience that the number one concern that I hear from seniors regularly is mobility and how they get around. Second, there will also be a workshop at, on food as medicine, and this will explore alternatives to current models of food access and food delivery that are generally uh, and uh, historically of poor quality and low satisfaction. We can do better. We'll also have a workshop on housing and community workshopping. And this uh, workshop will explore multi-generational living models. And I'm excited to see what kind of ideas are generated. And finally, we'll have an in-home technology for health and wellness workshop. And this will ex explore telemedicine, virtual reality, and LED lighting. Today's conversation is critical to understanding how Providence can tap into the silver economy by applying a creative, connected, and collaborative strategy. I look forward to working with all of you to ensure that this project will not only benefit our city and the surrounding communities, but also address the needs of our seniors. Today we begin a journey, and this journey will help us capitalize on all of the great resources that we have in our city, and I'm thrilled to have your interest, your support, and your engagement. Thank you all so much. Have a wonderful summit, and I look forward to seeing what great ideas are generated. Thank you all. Thank you, Mayor. And so, this morning so far, what I think we've done is the following, hopefully. One is that we've helped to frame the opportunity. And by doing so, Dr. Mondo's hopefully also helped us to reframe our language. How we think about burden versus opportunity, need versus asset, how we think about uh, the, the, the challenge as the market. So hopefully we begin to reframe our language. The mayor has talked about our capacity, the potential here that exists in our city to bring creative strategies to this opportunity. Um, so we have the capacity, we have the market. What we now need is, I think, is to help us think differently about how we approach these opportunities, right? So we have the capacity. How do we think differently? How do we approach this in a new way, with a new conversation and a new lens? So to help us do that, Martin Keene is going to join us uh, from Upright, Upright Vocal to really uh, give us a, a really brief primer, if you will, in design thinking that will really help us think differently about the questions that we ask and ultimately that the strategies and ideas that we develop. So Martin, would you please join me? Mayor Lorza, uh, for putting this initiative together. I think this is spectacular. And thank you, Betsy, for the invitation. Um, my, my background, I'm an industrial designer, and industrial designers, uh, my focus is always on product design, and I've always focused really on uh, you know, what human, human needs are. 
uh, human-centric design, uh, focusing on uh, products that we, we use, uh, interact with our bodies uh, all, all, uh, all day long. Not, not looking at tech, really just looking at um, things that, uh, that we use today and considering some of the unintended consequences that have been designed into these, these objects. Uh, you know, let me address just sort of you know, why, why we're here. I think this is about, uh, you know, our society really focuses on youth, and youth, as they say, is wasted on the young. I, I understand that more and more as I get older. Um, but it's also celebrated by our society, and particularly by the fashion industry. And fashion has led us astray in, in many ways. Um, you know, if you think about uh, the 1950s, early 1950s, when Madison Avenue really started focusing on the returning GIs from uh, World War II. Um, and that's sort of where our, our fashion uh, started in this, this massive fashion industry that we have now that started really focusing on the needs of those 17, 18, 19, 20 year old uh, young men and, uh, and their, and their you know, girlfriends, wives to be. Well, what's, what's interesting now, if you think about this month, uh, I, I think they say uh, the typical uh, baby, the, the average baby boomer is turning 71 this month. So these are the children of those returning GIs. So that's a pretty significant time frame we're looking at here. Um, I have a friend in the fashion industry who uh, does a lot of women's apparel. He bemoans the loss of sleeves on women's shirts. And I think he blames Michelle Obama for this. <laughs> Her big guns and everything. But, you know, I think, if you think about the elder, uh, an elder woman, she probably is not really looking forward to exposing her, her upper arms. Um, let's just be thankful they haven't taken the sleeves off of our winter coats yet. So maybe that's down the road. Um, the point is, our, our style and our proportions change over time as, as we get older. Um, and I think one of the ways the elderly are maligned with accusations of lack of style, uh, um, I say don't blame them, let's blame Madison Avenue and, the, and designers, really hasn't been a focus on, on fashion for, for uh, senior citizens. When looking at any design issue, any one design issue, uh, one needs to look at how we arrived at the current situations, um, and as Jim alluded to, just sort of this whole idea of design thinking, which is this, this term that's out there that I think is really a very practical thing. It's not anything complex. You don't need to go to design thinking school. You just need to understand that it's about asking the right questions and being a very good listener, a listener to your, to your own needs, your own personal needs, because some of the the most important needs come, of, come from our own realization of something that's wrong with something we're using, something that's a, a service that's out there that's not working. And sometimes it, it ends there. Sometimes we don't listen fully to ourselves or we feel we can't do anything about it. Uh, and that's, I think, where that, that next level is. How do we step up to the next level and do something about it? Really take these, these ideas that, that pop into our head and actually create something out of it, whether it's a, a new service, a new, a new business, a new design that uh, is less impactful on our, uh, on our bodies and, and you know, trying to correct some of these unintended consequences. Um, you know, as, as Jim said, are we asking the right, right questions? Um, do we need to kind of throw out the status quo and maybe reinvent, rethink? how we're considering things. Sometimes the status quo has a certain momentum to it that we think, oh, well, that's just the way things are done, and we just continue along that, that route. I, I, I say no, let's turn it on its head and look anew at, at things. And I tend, when I, when I start a design project, I tend to look back at our, our early beginnings as, as, uh, as primates. I mean, as the, the top of the food chain of a species that has everything on this planet. Uh, we take everything, we, uh, we, have, you know, we have the world, and we are at the top of the food chain, and we can make the biggest difference uh, for ourselves, for our climate, uh, for our aging population. So again, you know, is, is what we, we see as a daunting cost here actually human capital 
is a perceived burden and oppor an actual opportunity. So I'd like to kind of take you back to my journey as a product designer. I studied under German uh, designers, and so I was <laughs> driven uh, by this very rigid understanding of you know, listening carefully to the needs of the consumer, and and then applying very carefully without any superfluousness uh, the, the correct solutions. So again, going back to our evolution, and this is where I like to start, and what were some of the first tools we created as designers? In a sense, we were designing that first uh, sharpened knife when we discovered chert or flint and could create a very sharp edge with it. We realized we could hunt, we could skin animals, we could create uh, protection for our bodies, uh, create shelter. Um, so these early tools, I, I'm so fascinated by because they weren't, they were just absolute practical design. They were born of absolute need. I think we need to look, always look back and kind of peel back the layers of the onion to see where all the objects in the world that we use originated. Where, where was the original idea? What was the original intent? So I've spent my entire career focused on two products. And there's a uh, Scottish anthropologist named Tim Ingold who has addressed these two issues, and uh, these two objects, and he considers them uh, some of the most impactful uh, on, <clears throat> on, a, on us as a, as a people, and actually taking us away, both physically and mentally, from our animal past. And these two objects are the shoe and the chair that literally separate us from, from our earth, from the earth. We don't walk around barefoot anymore. Uh, we don't sit on the ground anymore. We don't squat. We've lost the ability to squat. Uh, even when we, were, when we were youth, we could still squat, but because we, we don't assume that posture anymore, we, we can't do it. So these are interesting things to consider. So Tim, Tim Inbold, you know, said that these things were the, you know, some of the most impactful things on our uh, on our animal past, on taking us away from our animal past. But they're also two of the objects that are most designed. Next to cars, I would say uh, footwear and chairs are two of the most designed objects in the world. So as an example of sort of throwing out the status quo, I went back to, uh, I was in the shoe business for many, many years, uh, 12 years uh, before I started my my first company, Keen Footwear, uh, in 19, uh, sorry, 2003, we launched. And, uh, you know, I, I was frustrated working for all these companies because I was just given this last shape. But the last is the form that a shoe is made on. And I never really understood where this form came from, except it sort of resembled a foot, but it wasn't, it didn't look like a human foot to me, not perfectly. So I started casting a lot of uh, my friend's feet because I felt that my shoes didn't fit fit me properly, they felt like they were uh, designed a little bit uh, with more fashion in mind. And I, so I started doing a little bit of research work, you know, the first footwear you can imagine. Uh, the Romans really developed the first footwear when they started uh, developing roads. They needed more protection for their, for their feet. Um, obviously when they started going up into the northern climate, uh, they wanted a little more warmth. So again, these were still functional utilitarian tools. But then what event happened? the Renaissance, and we all learned about fashion and how the objects that we wear are not just tools, they actually show other people how wealthy we are or how, how powerful we are. And that, that change from an object that is strictly a tool to an object that is fashionable has, has created a lot of unintended consequences. Initially with footwear that I'm understanding, um, through you know, uh, very narrow, narrow uh, footwear that have created a lot of issues with women's, women's feet, men's feet, both men and women get bunions uh, and uh, various foot deformities. Um, so I really, when I started my, uh, my footwear company, I really wanted to focus on a, a product that was addressing the human foot as we all know it to be when we're young. If you remember when you were a uh, small child, and you would, you know, your little babies can spread their toes like this. And I, we we can't, we don't do that anymore because we're constricted by these these small 
these small objects. So the second object, obviously the chair, is another tool that we use. And it was, you know, originally, if you think about the history of the chair, first we would have to build our own chairs, right? Prior to the Industrial Revolution, uh, when we can go to Sears Roebuck and buy a, buy a chair for you know, six or seven dollars. But before that, uh, when we were uh, nomadic people, the only person in our, in our group that would have a chair would be the elder. Everyone else would, would uh, be in service to that elder and would basically squat, sit on the floor. Um, so chairs have always had this, this, uh, this position in our, in our minds that we're, they're not just objects for leisure, their object is a symbol, the symbolism to a chair. And if you think back to the time, uh, the, the deities, I suppose, and the, the, uh, uh, the pharaohs, uh, nobility, kings and queens, you, they were always shown seated. So again, we wanted, to, we wanted to own one of these objects because we wanted to be that fashionable, powerful, self that we, we thought we were. I think this has led us astray. So uh, unfortunately, in the late 1800s, a um, gentleman by the name of uh, Frederick Taylor um, was a, uh, he was really the first work management consultant hired by Bethlehem Steel to uh, organize, help organize this new group of workers who would come together in, uh, in typing pools. And you know, this was a new thing, all gathering for work under one, one roof. So how do we control this new group of people that we need to get work out of? Uh, he's unfortunately responsible for prescribing the chair as our primary work tool. Um, we don't think a lot about chairs because, again, it's, it's the status quo. It's what we all do. We learn in school. Uh, sit down, stay still, pay attention. It's how we learn. We learn sitting down. We think that work can only get done when we're in a seated position. It's become part of our lexicon. Let's sit down and talk about that. The chairman of the board. So the chair is an object that rose up from this place of rest for an elder to now the object we primarily use for our work day. We also buy all the digital tools that make us efficient, but we don't think about the analog devices that we, we create. So I, what I've done in creating focal upright furniture, and I would encourage you to take a look. I don't have any visuals here. Take a look at what we've created. It's uh, the realization of ergonomists uh, since Frederick Taylor prescribed these, uh, these, these tools, these sit-down tools as our primary work, work device. Ergonomists really only studied sitting human and standing human. We never considered any other posture, except NASA. NASA has considered a third posture. It's the posture that we assume in zero gravity, or when you jump into a pool and sort of let yourself go. We assume this, you know, this very open, open hip posture. It's not sitting, it's not standing, but it's a neutral posture, meaning every muscle in our body is, in, is, is relaxed. Our spine, our pelvis, uh, and our, our quads are all aligned in a very, what's called neutral posture. So this is what I focused on. I have thrown, I've thrown out the status quo of using a, a chair. And again, this, so this started in 1995, 1994, when I moved to Rhode Island. I built a barn behind my house and realized that I didn't like sitting. I was a, in the footwear world designing shoes. I uh, realized that sitting for me just didn't work. I felt stifled. I felt uncreative. I lost my energy. I could only work for some number of hours. And I was a consultant in the industry, so the more juice I could squeeze out of myself, the more creativity, the more successful I could be. So, and I realized it was the chair. So I, I, I was, uh, at the time, I, I wasn't designing this thing for industry. I wasn't trying to create a, a furniture company. I just needed to be more creative myself. And I realized it was the object that I was using. I like standing, but standing is tiring. So how do I create an object, a tool, a new tool that is not a chair, and I'm not forced to stand all day? So I, again, I think it's throwing out the status quo and saying, this is wrong. 
there have been unintended consequences, and we've all heard sitting is the new smoking. Uh, we know the data about our increase, increased obesity uh, through, I think, from 1980 to today. I think we've gone from about 5% of BMI of over 30, uh, which is 30% um, overweight, uh, to, uh, I think, almost, we're almost in the 40. 40% of our nation is clinically obese today. And this isn't just because of, because we're sitting most of the day. It's because of our diet. We have bad diet. That's, it's, it's face, let's face it, a lot of people uh, can't afford uh, you know, these, these short, short, very fatty meals. You can only afford them. So, but I, I also think it's the static, <coughs> sedentary posture that we take all day. So what, what I, how I like to look at design is what have we done in the past? What have we created? What are the unintended consequences that those objects have, have brought upon us? And how can we com look completely anew? You know, look back at the human body and say, okay, well, what, what does the human body actually need to perform learning, to perform work, to be attentive and engaged in what we do? So that's really what my, my focus has been. And I think the, in addressing the concerns of, of the aging and, and uh, you know, what are some of the physical tools that are needed. Obviously, digi the digital tools that we are seeing coming into the home now are hugely beneficial. Uh, voice control, you know, voice control, uh, which I think is, is absolutely spectacular. It, may, it gives me, I have two elderly parents. My father's 90, uh, sorry, 82. My mother turns 80 this year. And you know, it gives me great peace of mind knowing that if they, my father falls down the stairs, my mother is out he can say, hey, I need some help to a robot that's in. So these things are absolutely incredible. Wearables, I have both my parents uh, wearing wearables now with you know, Bluetooth connectivity, so I know how they're doing, and that's great peace of mind. So these sorts of things, when we kind of think about the physical nature, of what, what do we need? What do we need to understand from uh, the population that we care most about, our parents, our our friends' parents. And so these, this is the kind of this is the way I, I look, look at things. It's really trying to peel back the onion, get back down to the, the crystal of, of the right idea, and try and address it anew. So I, I thank you for your time. Um, it's, it's been a pleasure to be here. I uh, look forward to mingling with a lot more of you and getting more involved in this uh, this great initiative. So thank you. again for your wonderful words, uh, again, to help us think about the opportunity, our capacity, and now thinking differently about uh, how we approach what's before us. Uh, a couple of administrative notes. Uh, first, I want to thank our, all of our sponsors again, including our lead sponsor, Lifespan, for their generous support. I know Peter Snyder's in the back, so thanks again to Lifespan and all of our sponsors for your generous uh, support for making today happen. Uh, we are going to sort of skip the break, but we will make sure you get out of your seats, right? I'm just joking. So uh, for those of you who are going to stay here for the uh, first session, uh, which is going to be on, on a second.